You're listening to TJ's One of Us for the Always Next Year Podcast Studio Network. You can find the team on our Twitter, at ANY Podcast. You can also find us on our website, www.alwaysnextyearpodcast.com. And now, to bring us in, the Jackdaws. A fighting man I used to be, revered and feared through Killarney. Now I'm back, to hitching me and throwing. But if Mickey Flynn should ever fight me, I'll throw me call shit all behind me and square off on that son of a bitch again. He cracked up in a river too, he beat me Sunday through and through. And so she over my unconscious frame. All right, we are back at the ANY PD Podcast Network here, and this is Scott, your host, talking with a new guest host we have on this week, one of our writers at ANY PD, uh, Andrew. Andrew, how's it going, man? I'm doing pretty well today. Thank you, Scott. How are you? Pretty good. So Andrew is currently in Oklahoma. Um, we're, we're branching out a bit here and trying to get some of our writers involved on the show. So a couple, couple weeks leading up to the season, basketball news is picking up and, and getting hot again. So we wanted to give one of our writers a shot. So Andrew, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you ended up working with us at NYPD Podcast Network? Right, so um, I've, I've been following the Twitter account for a while, and I remember Shane posted something back over the summer about looking for new writers. So I reached out to him and he got back to me and I originally started out writing a lot of Phillies articles. And then I started, or I wrote my first Sixers article a few weeks ago and about the upcoming season and the bench depth that they have this year compared to last year. And that's where I'm at as far as writing recently with the Sixers. Cool. Uh, so, you know, I suggest all of our writers go check out that piece. I had, read a little bit myself it was definitely good stuff um but andrew we're happy to have you here today to to change things up a little bit um so why don't you tell everyone how you ended up in oklahoma as well so uh first i uh, i'm also very excited to have do my first podcast today so thank you for having me on but um the so i got my undergrad at oklahoma state in sports management and media after going to a camp towards the end of my junior year of high school and I really liked the Oklahoma area so I applied to Oklahoma State. Once I got in I was set with going there and basically stopped applying to other schools. So I went four years at Oklahoma State and really liked really liked the area. Had an internship at their athletic department and after I graduated this past May 2019 I went back home for the summer, was applying for jobs and Got some help from my uh, previous boss at Oklahoma State, who reached out to where I'm at now in Alva, Oklahoma, at Northwestern Oklahoma State University, which is a Division II school. And now I'm in their athletic communications department, writing a bunch of stuff for them, doing graphic work, and uh, also going for my master's in sports administration. Oh, nice, dude. Well, we're happy to have you on here. I didn't, I didn't realize it was your first podcast, too, so we're... Uh... We're definitely popping your cherry a little bit with that one. I'm excited to hear that. Yes. Um, so then, and then my last bit on you know just Oklahoma State in general here is I, I mean, I'm a bit of a sports gambler. I don't know Shane and I don't talk too much about it, um, but I always, always crush betting on Oklahoma State during football and NCAA basketball. So I thank you and your alma mater for all the money you guys have made. <laughs> I know our offense is very reliable, so you can definitely have the over on us. <laughs> For sure. That's usually my bet. And then I have a buddy uh, buddy back east who, who went to Nova that that was his move. I think he literally paid for all of his beer money through college by betting on Oklahoma State overs. So, um, But enough on, on your alma mater here. Let's get in talking some NBA basketball on the TJ's One of Us segment here. So in the last week, um, we had seen the first repercussions of the new NBA tampering rules. The Milwaukee Bucks were the first team fine because they had talked about, you know, trying to get Giannis back to the team and talked about his future contract outside of the period when you were allowed to talk about contracts. I believe the fine was about 50 grand, which is just pennies. I mean, for an NBA team and for Giannis in that, in that respect as well, I'm sure he could, he could have cared less about it, even if it was paying him, but, thought this was pretty pertinent news number one because it was the first 
you know, incident of where the fine uh, or the tampering rules had been rained down on someone. And also the Sixers seem to follow all these stupid rules and not, not, you know, play against them and doing anything crazy aside from, you know, maybe tweeting at someone. Um, so I want to, Andrew, I want to get your take on how you feel that all these new stupid tampering rules that the NBA has put in place. I mean, I think we can all agree how strict it is and it's, very annoying at times just because like you see all these small little detailed things go on and the the big thing the one big one back last uh towards the end of last season was when doc rivers was on espn and compared Kawhi to uh, michael jordan and they got fined for that and that's it's just a stupid thing to in my opinion it just hurts the game because all it is is a coach talking about a player and comparing him to one of the greats and there's just no reason for him to get fined for that and here you see the Bucks do it. I mean, whether you can say they cheated or not with Tampa, I don't think it's really much of a cheating case, but it got them to save their superstar players. So maybe that fifty extra $50,000 is worth it. It might, yeah. And that, that was actually one of the things I was thinking of. Is is this now just included in NBA marketing budgets? I mean, fifty grand, like I said, is nothing. So they're if, if it gets them more airtime or, you know, people are talking about them, then, I mean, hey, we're not Bucks fans. Shane and I talk about how we don't even like Giannis most of the time. Um, and we're talking about them. So it, it, it's a way to put your team in the news. But I agree with you. I think I think it's ridiculous. Let them let them say whatever they want. I mean, I don't I don't even have a problem when they're just outright campaigns for you know, when players are just begging to have someone come on their team. I mean, LeBron will certainly find some way to to bend these rules and not get in trouble for it and just have the NBA wrapped around this finger again and you know I, to me I, I just I see this as just like a stupid slap on the wrist thing and teams are just not going to look too far into it and just either take the fine or just keep doing the tampering they, they just don't care like well and that's that's the thing because like like we just said the money's not that big of a deal to a NBA franchise let alone the player chips in with all the money they get so unless they do something like the NFL where you lose a draft pick or something, I know there's only two rounds in the NBA, so you might not be able to do it in that sense. But like I know in the NFL, I forget which team it was, but they lost like a fourth round draft pick. So like unless you start taking something away outside of money, I don't think teams are going to care that much, and you're not going to see these issues resolved if at all. But I mean, I mean if the Sixers got to save, say in five years when Ben Simmons becomes a free agent again. If that's their way of saving him, I'm all for giving him or paying a fifty thousand dollar fine. So, yeah, no, I I completely agree. Um, this is definitely just marking a new era in the NBA. When <laughs> you got to imagine that the uh, the execs in the NBA front office are now just all over Twitter. They're all over just every social media outlet. They're looking for tampering. They're you're just kind of acting like cops sitting out, you know, at a, at a fucking speed trap in a school zone, like just trying to, to catch people and get this fifty thousand dollar fine, which begs a question to me: Do you know where this fifty grand goes? Like, what? Who who is getting rich off of this? Or like, what what is it? Like, where does it go? <laughs> That's actually an actual excellent question. I'm not sure. If I had to guess, maybe either the league gets it, or maybe they. If they're, I don't know, I think a smart idea, maybe like donate it to one of the league charities or something. I think that'd be a cool idea to do. But as far as where it goes right now, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping they donate it too. But again, that, that really doesn't further the case of the NBA either. Because if, so if you're telling me that for tampering, the only punishment I get is helping out a charity somewhere in the country, then cool. I'm going to do that 10 times out of 10. <laughs> That's a fair point. I didn't think of. But, uh. Yeah, I just don't. I just don't want the NBA getting that money that you know. I, I have to imagine is like most of my one ticket that when I go out and see the Sixers in LA or you know when I'm back home for a game or something. I don't want my like thirty dollars I spend going from the Sixers to the NBA because we were tampering. It's bullshit. Can't handle it. <laughs> Absolutely. And the other thing I I wonder like. If teams and players are just smart about it, it's got to be pretty hard to get caught. Like, I feel like, I don't know, Brett Brown can call anybody in the league on his cell phone or something and get away with it because I doubt the league's checking that that far into it. As long as you're not stupid and do something on social media, like, I feel like it's got to be hard to get caught. 
Yeah, I, I agree. They're they're not idiots. I mean, the the NBA coaches and NBA players. I mean, they're they're living in a time when just their lives are just almost constantly under a microscope. So I mean, I'm sure they they have secret ways around this, and they're they're not just going to be idiots about it. So I agree. Um, all right, well let, let's move on a little bit from the tampering topic and talk about something a little more fun. Um, so when I was doing one of my daily sweep of NBA Reddit the other day. I had seen that it has now been one year since we got the iconic Kawhi laugh and I'm a fun guy quote. Um, I saw that. I watched the video probably a solid 10 times and I laughed at my desk when I probably should have been doing work, but uh, don't tell my boss, please. But so that got me thinking right away that the Sixers have been a team that has been, you know, I like to think of this as more quiet in the most part, but we've had some big moments in social media over the last couple of years. So we're going to break this segment into two bits here. Number one, we're going to talk about the, the rest of the Sixers and give them, them all a chance in their time in the spotlight. Um, and then we're going to talk about Joel Embiid and everything he has done since he's joined the NBA and some of his greatest moments on Twitter, on Instagram, and in the public. All right, so Andrew, I'm going to let you start off with this one. What was something that you remember from the last few years that the Sixers have, you know, been that was funny in social media or on Twitter or just just a memeable moment? Uh, I'd say to start off with something funny before we get into any more like serious is- issues with social media. So I'd say when we got uh, Tobias Harris and Boban, I mean, they were just a fun, unique duo on social media, and they were always posting memes of some type of fun video they had and i mean we can start with anyone i don't know if you remember the one that sticks out to me i remember the uh, chicken noodle soup one they did when i think ben simmons was part of it and it was just a funny thing oh i love the toby and Bobby show they're they're awesome Bo- Bobby is just he's a one-of-a-kind guy he's so ugly but he's he's a movie star now so you got to respect him um we will definitely miss him in the city if if for not just, you know, the way that he, he was all over social media and just always tweeting things out. And, you know, that, that was just a great friendship. Um, I agree with that. That's definitely one of the things I have on my list here. Um, one of the other ones I remember, too, is Jaleel Okafor when he joined the Sixers. And, you know, this was kind of when Embiid was not really playing and he was just learning social media. Julio Okafor was kind of the bad boy of the Sixers for a hot weekend or two there. Um, there was a period of time when he got caught just in a bar fight in Boston, I believe, when he was 19 or 20 years old. Um, I think I remember being over Thanksgiving break, I think in like 2013, if I remember correctly. Um, do you do you remember that happening? Yeah, I, I definitely remember the fight. I couldn't tell you like a specific year, but um, that was, I think... They were up there. They lose to the Celtics. And I think fans were like trolling them about. And obviously, that was through our dark times of the process when we were tanking. So I think fans were just heckling them and stuff. And and he just had too much of it. So he started a brawl outside the bar, and it escalated from there. And I think I don't think anything too serious came about from it. But that was definitely a big situation for a young guy like him who's trying to develop. Yeah, it. Um, I tell you what, that was something I liked about Julio Okafor, and it's funny thinking back. You know, the guy's a vegan now. He's he's moved on with his life. He's clearly older and matured, but that was when he was living kind of his bad boy lifestyle a little bit and couldn't handle people heckling him, especially in Boston of all places. I mean, I thought it was funny that he got caught. You know, clearly out at a bar drinking. I mean, those guys like obviously they're if they're not twenty one, they still get into bars and stuff. I mean, they're NBA players. They're giants. No one's. No one's carding him and not letting him in the bar. Um, But I thought it was just, it was funny that he got off the hook with that, that the Sixers were so irrelevant at that point. People were so mad about the process that they didn't even want to talk about, you know, the struggles of a young NBA player who was picked in the first round. Um, He's a lottery pick for the Sixers and he got into a bar fight, which is an awful look for the league. They can't have something like that. Um, Then not much longer after that, he got a, he got a, Speeding ticket as well, I believe going down 95, got like, it's going like 150 or like some egregious amount. And no one cared about that either. The guy just kind of, we were just so irrelevant. Nobody cared about anything that he did. Um, Just hilarious to me looking back on it. It's just, he didn't get a fair reception in the city. So even when he was acting out trying to be a bad guy, he got no love. 
And I, yeah, that's just the funny thing. Like with, I mean, as long as it's not too serious of an issue, these 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 young players get away with a lot of stuff. And I mean, like they're so young, you think like they would try to do something. Like the NBA would try to do something to get them to behave better. Like how does the NBA not even step in and like take take account in some of these issues? Because like like you said, it's a bad look for the NBA. So you think they'd at least want to do something to try to make it. A better situation but for them to just brush it off was the most surprising part about it all but i mean it's funny for or kind of funny for fans to see at least but i, I just it's just it's funny to think about how like if that was like so, a, a different 19 year old getting in a fight and underage like that like the re, the repercussions is like 100 percent different yeah they're they're very different i mean i'm i'm only a year or two older than julia local for um so it was pretty pertinent to me. I, I remember I had friends who, like you said, there were serious repercussions, and they got caught out fighting. Like he didn't even get a slap on the list. He just a wrist. He he just got a well. Oh, that's cute. Like he's just going through some growing pains and stuff, and playing on a terrible team and in a rough city in Boston visiting. Like, uh, but yeah. So he just got off the hook there. Um. So then let's talk. I mean, we we have to talk about the Colangelo thing where <laughs> the his collars were brought into play when he, his wife was found to have all of those uh, fake Twitter accounts and was tweeting at him. And um, have, have you, have you had a chance to reread any of that stuff that happened about a year or two ago? Um, it was wild. And that's, I remember when that whole thing went down, it was just like, it was such a shocking moment. And like, as a fan, I didn't know what to expect from it, to believe it, like whether to believe it or was it fake or whatever. And you didn't know like how it would affect the team in general. I know, I don't know about you, but I know I was scared where it was like some of these players might leave because I wouldn't want to be a part of an organization like that. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. That My biggest fear with Joel Embiid was just going to get tired of the city and find some way out. Um or Ben Simmons, or just one of our, our guys that was homegrown talent that, you know, trusted so much in the front office. Um, yeah, I, I was worried about it, but it really just made us the laughing stock of the NBA. That was my biggest problem with it. We were just getting over the process kind of nickname, you know, people were starting to believe in us a little bit more. We, we were, John Beat is becoming a real star in the league beyond just as, as a joke. He's just so tremendously talented. Ben Simmons was coming into his own and, Colangelo just goes and screws up all that hard work. And, I mean, good riddance. We needed to get rid of him anyway. He was a freaking bum, but that is not the way you want someone to go out. I, I mean, it was it was just embarrassing, to say the least. I, I, I had, we had to talk about it, right, because it was such a big deal in Sixer social media. But in my eyes, I just want to put that out of my memory. It was, it was not a good time. I, I didn't. I mean, being out in California, I, I am often asked about anything Philadelphia related, and that was something people kept asking me about, and I just kept brushing it off. And like, ah, I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't read up on it yet, but but I knew everything about it. I was, I was following up on it. And I was just embarrassed. <laughs> well, I could definitely relate to that. Being in Oklahoma, I get the same type of stuff. People are always asking about Philadelphia stuff, and when, I mean, when that and that when that happened, we were already since we were tanking stuff, we were already the laughing stock of the NBA, and then to have Sam Hinkie basically forced out and, and the NBA basically forced into Colangelo's to our franchise. And then to have that even go down even more, it made the whole laughing stock even worse. So, like, yeah, it just kept trickling on and getting, like, worse and worse as the years going on. But at least finally he's out of the organization, whether even though it was forced. But it was th- definitely something fans were waiting for, for to happen for a while. Yeah, no, I agree. It, uh it was just a ridiculous scenario. And I think that'll be something that in 25 years, you know, when we're, we're talking to our kids or, or any younger people that weren't alive during that era, that would be a pretty hard thing to explain. Um, number one, I don't know if Twitter will still even be a thing because who knows how long social media stays around and, or what direction it goes in. But number two, it's just, a uh, it's going to be crazy that a GM's wife was the one that brought the GM down. Um, so let's step away from Colangelo because I hate giving that guy too much airtime. He definitely doesn't deserve it. And talk about when the Sixers rallied behind Kendall Jenner and just made her enemy number one. When you remember, I think it was her and one of the other Jenners were just sitting on or Kardashians, whatever the hell you want to call them, sitting on on the sidelines, courtside, and 
the Cavs came in and beat up the Sixers, and we immediately had just no time for Kendall Jenner. We wanted her to get out. She wasn't allowed in our city anymore, and I love the the banding together of everyone in Philadelphia just booing her and trying to get rid of her. It was it was awesome. Absolutely, it's it's not the players' fault they lost the game. It's all her fault. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they for sure. they were undefeated at home before she showed up, so. Yeah. <laughs> and we lost to an embarrassing Cavs team. You can't have that. Like, well, that, yeah, that was the worst part. It wasn't like it was a good, close, hard fought game against like the Celtics or something. Or you're fighting with it was a, it was a give me game where you expected to win. And I, I don't remember if it was. I don't think it was. I think it was more on the, a double digit side than a close game if I remember. But yeah, we got smoked. Absolutely smoked. Um, it was. It was not good. It was embarrassing. And like you said, we, we took it all out on her. It was clearly all her. Um, I get what Ben Simmons is doing. I mean, heck, if either of us had a chance to date a Kardashian, I'm pretty sure we would drop everything we're doing right now and go date her. Um, but, you know, as a city, we, we can't have that. We can't have someone affecting our team. It's just we have no time for it. And if I remember correctly, wasn't there like a petition for her to get banned from the Wells Fargo Center or whatever? Yep. We, we put that together. And... <laughs> I think she still might not be allowed back. So, you know, Zaire Smith, don't get any ideas, buddy. You're not dating one of the Jenners. I'm sorry. We're not doing it. Um, but at the same time, if you got to do it, go ahead. We understand a little bit. Um, then, I mean, we talk about Mike Scott constantly on the show. Um, I'm definitely a member of the Hive. I'm always following what that guy's doing. And that, that's probably, I mean, it's one of my favorite things to see on Twitter all the time is, you know, what Mike Scott's doing, who who he's having a nerf fight with, or what kind of race he's getting in with someone. So we have to talk a little bit about Mike Scott here. Um, I'm sure everyone is almost tired of me talking about him at this point, although he's still lovable. No one, I'm sure everyone still still enjoys the banter. We have to do it. But Andrew, what uh, what's one of your favorite Mike Scott moments from the last, I would say, you know, six months or so? I would say the one that always comes to mind, like almost like immediately, is the game against the uh, Bucks where he like dives into the stands and he's just sitting next to that fan, grabs grab his cup cup of beer and just takes a sip out of it. That, yeah. I mean, that makes me laugh every time I see that video. Oh, it's it's a great video. Um, one of one of Shane's prop bets from earlier in the year because we every once in a while just throw stuff like this out. How, what would you place the over under on beers Mike Scott drinks during the year during games in the Wells Fargo Arena? The sorry, you're here, over under on the the beers. The, the the number of drinks that Mike Scott consumes during Sixers basketball games in the Wells Fargo Arena. Oh, that's I'd go probably like three. Yeah, that. I, th- I think we had said two and a half, three, somewhere in there. Um, I'm going for the over on that. I want to see him jumping in the stands and drinking more. Um, I mean, imagine if you're down court side for an NBA game and Mike Scott jumps into your lap. I'm handing that guy my beer. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Take it. <laughs> yeah, he deserves it. Whatever he needs to get through the third quarter, I'm all in for it. Um, all right, so let's move on a little bit to our or my favorite NBA player and a guy who has been a bit quiet this off season, but you know, we, we finally gotten some life out of him as of late Joel Embiid. Um, so what, what has been one of your favorite things that Joel Embiid has done, you know, since he started with the Sixers, let's go all the way back. I think, I don't know if you ever saw the video, but he had, it was, was kind of like that one he just released with the spicy chips, but he had one with a spicy wing challenge a few years ago and that 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 was one of the funniest things i saw he was like it was like supposed to be like a really spicy wing challenge for him and he was like taking it like eating it like it was nothing i don't know if you ever saw that one but yeah the hot ones i i love hot ones and he was great on it um <laughs> i remember the video too he just powered through it all with zero zero pain zero effect at all um and on, at that point on the show there was videos of celebrities crying eating the wings not being able to get through it um yeah, he went out and was just a, a beast, an absolute beast. Um, so you'd mentioned, too, the, the one chip video that he brought up the other day, which was an important video for all of us to see. Number one, because we saw Joel Embiid kind of crumble a little bit eating this chip, and it was it was hilarious. And, you know, if, if anyone hasn't seen the video yet, I strongly suggest you go watch it. It was Joel Embiid one chip challenge where he eats a ghost pepper chip, I believe. Um, 
But one of the things Joel Embiid mentioned in there was how he had lost 20 pounds in the offseason and was about to gain it all back by all the milk he was going to have to drink from the stupid one-chip challenge. Um, to me, it was important to hear, you know, that he's, he's down 20 pounds or so and he's getting serious about the year. But also, it was important to me that he hopped back into the spotlight. We haven't seen much of him lately. I've been wondering where he's been. And apparently, he's just been training the whole time. Um, I mean, he looks great. Absolutely. And that's... First of all, I didn't know MB could crumble down like that. I thought that was one of the funniest things about the video. Is like I didn't know he could fall over like that because he always, like from the wing challenge, he was always shows how tough he is and never felt like that. But um, as far as yeah, that was, like you said, he's been so quiet this off season. And like obviously, we all saw him crying after the the game seven last year against the Raptors. And I mean, he was saying how much he was taking it to heart, but I mean, you can only take like words for so much, but I think the silence and then him releasing that video, like I think that really shows how much he really took this off season to go about training and getting in better shape. And I mean, as a fan, that makes me very excited to see where this goes. Cause I think that was, I think we can all agree as MB's biggest issue was the way he kept his body in shape for games. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think we're getting the, you know, the, the season where Joel Embiid becomes a man a little bit, if you will, um, takes his body seriously, realizes, you know, that he's not just a young kid. They can eat whatever he wants and do whatever he wants. You know, he needs to take care of himself because we're not just worried about this season. We're worried about the next couple of years because he's, he is our franchise. I mean, he is the process. Like we need him around and we need him healthy. So this was huge for me. I had, I had a big smile on my face watching the video. Num- number one, because of the, him crumbling and falling apart and guys just comedic gold but number two because he looks so good and I'm it just got me real amped up for the season right away and I've been in basketball mode ever since um so one of my favorite things that Joel B did was when he learned Twitter way back when and he was hollering at Rihanna and Kim Kardashian um every once in a while he still takes a shot at Rihanna which cracks me up every time he does it and I think it's the best bit out there from an athlete it's it's amazing and that's something that's never going to end. Like he, he loves it so much where he will continue to do that until I, I think he'll probably even do it after retirement. But no, it, his, his love for social media is one of the funniest things. And I think that's something we can all agree is we're all thankful that he learned, or tw- he learned Twitter because the, the amount of trolling he does or reaching out to Rihanna or the Kardashians, like you just said, it, it just makes it so much better. Oh, that's great. And let's talk, talk a little bit about his trolling. Um, so you brought up right before we hopped on air that he, he tweeted out uh, trolling the Eagles a little bit. Why don't, why don't you tell us about what Joel did in the last week? So, I mean, so the Eagles had that Thursday night game against the Packers, and right, I think it was right around kickoff. He tweeted out, go Pack O. And the Eagles responded to the tweet, which I thought was funny. It was just a picture of Embiid wearing a swoop hat on the field. I thought that was like, it was just like, there was no words to it. It was just that picture. So I thought that was pretty funny. And then he responds to the Eagles tweet with the picture of Mike Scott. Cause we all know Mike Scott got in that, the uh, tailgate fight or whatever. And he said, be careful. Cause I'm going to send my man for y'all at, and tweeted at the Eagles. So I just thought that was a funny interact interaction between the two uh, Embiid and the teams and, and the Eagles. And, just the way that goes down, it's just fun how this like the city always brings in all the athletes together and like they just combine to make it a fun a city presence for all the players and teams. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think uh, we're we're entering a, a really good era in all Philadelphia sports where we have a bunch of young talent that's you know homegrown or you know newer to the city. They all seem to be banding together and stuff like this is always great when we get kind of like crossover episodes, if you will, like. Like when Joel Embiid's talking shit to the Eagles and obviously trolling and making a joke. Um, when Mike Scott, you know, I think he had actually even said something the other day about how he's wearing a white T-shirt to, to the Eagles game from now on. Um, just just different stuff like that. You know, I, I love seeing it. But Joel is the best with it. I mean, he, he doesn't have to do that and troll the Eagles, but, but he does. My favorite outcome of this has been the amount of just older people that don't understand Twitter. That just were, were talking to me at work or, you know, I, I saw a couple people out and they were concerned. They were like, well, and doesn't like the Eagles. This is a problem. And I was like, don't you guys get that was a joke, right? Like he totally was just making fun of the Eagles and talking shit. Like I, I don't think we're starting a controversy here. It was lighthearted. Um, you know, you got, you got to know Joel Embiid as a person to, 
to understand the the level of trolling that he does. And that's exactly it. And like like you said, it's just funny. Like because I don't know, but I listen to a lot of the radio stations, the sports radio stations in Philly, and I think it was a. Uh, the morning team on WIP, they spent like 15 minutes talking about like how could MB tweet Go Paco or whatever at be, playing with the Sixers. And I'm like, it's all just fun and games and a joke. It's like MB. It's not like it's someone else. And it's not like he's dressed in full Packers gear or anything. Like, it's just, it's funny how serious it can get taken and like uh, taken out of context. Yeah, I agree. People, I, I haven't listened to WIP in kind of a while, but I, that doesn't surprise me one bit that those guys went after him for that. I mean, they're they're a bit older, and uh, they, I don't know. They, I mean, the Philadelphia Philadelphia sports talk radio is is a special breed, in my opinion. Um, everything gets blown out of proportion so much more than in any other area of the country. Um, I mean, I don't listen to a ton of sports talk radio out here in LA, and I, I never really have in too many other cities, but. You know, just the little clips I see here and there. No, no one raises the red flag and starts controversy quite like the guys in Philadelphia. So that that doesn't surprise me one bit. Um, but <laughs> the other thing too, now that now that we're talking about Joel Embiid, I, just have, I have a big smile on my face. I have so many good memories buzzing through before he could even really play when he was he was just bored all the time, or right when he was starting out his career and figuring the city out. Do you remember when he was the original kind of like Mike Scott thing where Mike Scott goes and plays with people in the city or with Nerf Gun Wars? Joel Embiid was just going to playgrounds around the city and stopping in and dunking on kids. There were probably like 10 plus videos of him just dunking on like five foot eight, like scrawny white guys like out at playgrounds. I, I remember those. It's, and I think he's starting to go back to, to doing that to stuff too more and more uh outside this off like before this off season but like that's what i just love it when players or players do that like that's just it's a funny thing for them it's a funny thing for fans it's a fun way to interact and it's it's such a cool moment for them i mean obviously with the guy like Embiid, we were all scared like oh what if he gets hurt or whatever but that's just the fun in, in the athlete and that's just the fun way to see him enjoy the time as a player yeah, I agree. I love when he interacts with that. And it's also easy to forget, you know, because Joel Embiid is such a monster that he is just a young kid. Like, he, he wants to be out there playing on the playground with, with other guys around his age and, you know, interacting and meeting new friends. Like, yeah, he is a multi, multi-millionaire and he is the, the biggest star in one of the biggest, uh, you know, basketball, like, cities in, in the country and in the world. Um, but he is just a young kid at heart. And I don't know, I, I love seeing him out there, too. Um, so yeah, do you have any closing thoughts on anything, you know, Joel and Bead Twitter related or just Sixers in general Twitter related? Yeah, I guess, I guess the one last, the one last Embiid one, I know we've been talking about him for a while, but was the uh, one when the, I forget who it was, if it was some reporter or whatever, was questioning about how he started shooting threes and stuff. And he was just like, well, I just went on YouTube and searched white, white people shooting three pointers. Yeah. I just thought that was just a funny way about how he went about social media and learned how to play the game of basketball and stuff. Yeah, no, I love that when he decided he wanted to be a point guard and he wanted to shoot threes. I, uh, I'm i not a big fan of Joel Embiid getting out of the post and shooting threes, but I loved when that went down. And there was all those videos of him just training threes in practice. And that was back when we didn't know if he was ever really going to play or come to fruition. He was just kind of a legend at that point, just lighting up threes. And, I mean, just taking him from Steph Curry range, too, that, that was that was an awesome era in Joel Embiid's life and, and Sixers' life in general. Um, all right, so let's change uh, tune, our tune here a little bit and get a little worked up one more time. Um, so we had our lighthearted segment with Joel Embiid and social media. But I want to bring back one of our old favorite segments, the return of why do we hate that guy? So the concept behind this segment when we brought it up was in Philadelphia, we, we hate so many different people that it's really easy to lose track of why we hate them all. So I want to ignite that hate again and remind all of us why we don't like certain players or coaches. Um, this week, I wanted to touch base on why we don't like Andrew Bynum. Um, so Andrew Bynum was traded to the Sixers back in 2012. He was part of the deal that sent Dwight Howard out to the Lakers, which was a, another disaster of a deal. Uh, we talked a little bit about Dwight Howard last week and how that guy's just falling apart, but you know cannot get his shit together and just 
really hasn't been telling the truth for years. You know, I, I can't believe a word that guy says was involved in a ton of controversy last year. But I don't want to give him too much more time. I want to direct my hate towards Andrew Bynum and his glass knees. Andrew, do you remember the whole Andrew Bynum saga and his short but hate-filled tenure here in Philadelphia? Yes, I remember. I remember the actually. I mean, obviously, I don't remember the exact date, but I remember exactly. Where I was on vacation when it happened in the summer, and I remember seeing the trade, and like you're like, wow, we just traded Iguodala, who was supposed to be the franchise player, or whatever, and Andrew Bynum was like such a big like NBA star at the time. He was like averaging a double double, and I was so excited, and then everything just went downhill from there. From he had the knee issue, and then he just. The thing that I hated the most about him was like he showed no 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 effort at all to get back on that court and like play at all that season, and it just made me so frustrated because what could have been of that team I still wish we could have found out if he would have actually tried. Yeah, I agree. That was a dark time in in Sixers basketball because we traded away Andre Iguodala. You know, we were just kind of admitting that we needed to go through the process at that point and. Things were not good, and then to, to make matters worse, we had this bum Andrew Bynum who has one bad knee already and then was out bowling and hurt his other knee even further. So he was barely ever even on the court for the Sixers. We never got to see what he could have been like. I, to be honest, I mean, we're, we're probably better off in the long run than he just didn't even try playing and didn't put in any effort, and we get to just make fun of him now in this stupid segment and talk about why we hate him. That's probably all the value that he ever was going to provide for our city. But, you know, to me, I agree. The lack of effort, the fact that he was out bowling with a knee injury is just so ridiculous to me. Um, I know Shane and I have both talked a bit about our knee injuries um, in the past. Andrew, do you have you ever had a knee injury of any sort? No, luckily, I, luckily, I've not had any injury. Knock on wood. But <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, I hope I didn't just jinx you, and you're now going to join the glass knee club like like Shane and I. But um. One of the things that I remember, so when I hurt my shoulder, when I hurt my knee, one of the things the doctor always mentions is don't do something stupid, like go bowling or play volleyball or just things that you would casually do and take for granted. And I can't imagine the doctor didn't tell Andrew Bynum, like, hey, by the way, we know you're a bowler. You can't bowl when you have a knee injury. Your plant leg, is his left knee is somewhat healthy now. You're going to screw it up, you know, or you're going to hurt your right knee even further. Like, you, you can't do that kind of stuff as an NBA player when you're making tens of millions of dollars. I mean, it, it is so ridiculous to me that he wasn't focusing on his recovery and trying to get better. Um, I don't even know where Andrew Bynum actually went after the Sixers. I don't really know whatever happened to the guy. I think he just dropped off the face of the earth and is sitting back home in a mansion counting all his money now. Well, that's the thing. He was like, it was such, he was such a phony, is what, like, cause he had that, he had that press conference where like a ton of the city came to support him and like the reporters, and it was like, it just, it was all fake. Like he made it seem so real, and he was excited, and it just turned out to be all fake. And then he, he continued to bury himself. I remember he went, didn't he go? I think if I remember correctly, he went to it was either the Cavs or Pacers, and then he got in trouble for like, uh, having, I think he had an affair with one of the assistant coaches' wives or something like that, and. He got in, he got suspended from whatever team he was on, and then eventually cut from them. He, he was just a big he was a, he was a fraud. Like he had so much talent, but he just wasted it, and that that's why I hate him the most. Yeah, no, I I agree. The guy is, fraud is definitely a good word. Um, that's that's probably the only real way that we could describe Andrew Bynum is just fraud, phony, and he will live in infamy in the A N Y P. Why do we hate that guy? Hall of Fame now with him and Matt Geiger. Um, and I believe Shane had also inducted Lou Williams there too. So, so we're going to, we're going to keep him there and, you know, Andrew Bonham, screw you stay away from us. Um, but if you want to hop on the show and refute your case, you know, go ahead. But I highly doubt Andrew Bonham is out there listening to anything Sixers related at this point. Cause I would imagine he, he probably doesn't like us too much. Either. So we were definitely not nice to the guy and rightfully so at that point. That that would be a fun debate to have with Andrew Bynum. <laughs> that, I would love to have that talk. <laughs> yeah, like why why he thinks that he was a good basketball player, a good sixer. Yeah, I I agree. I would I would love to talk to Andrew Bynum about that. Um, all right. So usually one of the segments that we do on the show is the top five media players of the week. Um, we did have media day in the NBA today, 
And I have not had a full chance to digest all of it yet. Um, Andrew, I'm not sure how much you've had to, to digest from all the media day coverage and stuff. So I didn't want to fully delve into that quite yet. Um, I did want to give you a couple minutes if you've had a chance to read any of it, Andrew. I'm not sure if you had. Um, do you have any, do you have any comments on anything you you'd heard thus far? I, I got to read into it a little bit, but I, I was working most of the day, so I didn't get to read too much into it like you. Um, I thought some, I thought Brett Brown had some fun, interesting things to say, which I actually think was a day before um, media day. But he had a comment about the offense, and I just thought it was a, it was a fun quote to read into it about. Now, now I'm blanking on it, but it was something about the offense playing. Let me try to think. It was like we are going to play bully ball defense and a certain style of offense. It'll come to me in a little bit, but okay. unfortunately, yeah. for, unfortunately, I'm blanking on it right now. But it was no, a fun fun quote to see about the offense and stuff. Yeah, no, that, that's okay. I uh, Like I said, I, I really have not had much of a chance. I, I did get to see a, a picture with the, the Sixers starting lineup all together, um, which was great for me to see, and – they are officially the tallest, longest starting lineup in the NBA. Um, I think that's obviously the the tune we're going for is being tough defensive and, you know, uh, very, very long. Just everyone on our team is a wing span of 10, 6, 10 or higher. Um, yeah, so, so it got me fired up, and I'm, I'm excited to sit down today and digest through all of that information. Um and we'll, we'll get back to you a little bit later this week or more than, more than likely early next week to, to do some full coverage on Media Day and get hyped up. We're only a couple weeks away from the, the regular season. So um, I'm, I'm getting pretty excited about Sixers basketball right about now. So with that in mind, I did want to run by a couple of recurring thoughts and bits that Shane and I have had on this show since I have started hosting it and since I had hopped on. Um, so, Andrew, if it's okay with you, I wanted to run a couple things by you and get your take on some stuff. Absolutely. All right. So one of the things that we've been talking about a ton this offseason and a ton lately has been the James Harden-Russell Westbrook dynamic. What do you think is going to happen in Houston this year? I Honestly, I think they're going to find a way to make it work. They've... They played with each other before in Oklahoma City. I know that was when they were young, and I feel like that was part of some of the issues. Uh, their coach, Mike D'Antoni, he's all about offense, and I think they find a way to make it work. I don't think they win the West, but I think they will definitely be a huge competition for whoever does come out of the West, and I think it's going to be one of the best duos in the NBA this year. Okay, so we had done our rankings of the top seven duos in the NBA and Shane had them listed exactly as that the best duo in all of the NBA. Um, so you're in agreement with him there. I, I don't quite share that same thought. I mean, everyone's heard me talk ad nauseum at this point that about how I, I don't quite get how the dynamics going to work. Um, it's come out in the last week that they're, they're going to stagger time and only really play together in crunch time here. Um, but I'm more confused about it now. I don't know how it's going to work. Uh, Russell Westbrook seems to be somewhat humble in, in talking about James Harden and did some videos of them boxing together and training and stuff. So, I don't know. It's one of the things I'm most excited about this year. Um, one of the other things we always talk about quite a bit, and we have to, right? We're a Sixers podcast. It's the Ben Simmons jump shot. So, how, how do you feel about Ben Simmons' jump shot? Do you think he needs one? Do you think he's suddenly going to become Steph Curry this year? What's your take on that? First, I think he absolutely does need one. I don't think that's why they lost last year, but I think it did play a role. I think he will shoot more, and I know we all we all saw the videos of him shooting threes and stuff in the off season. But I don't I don't know how you feel about it, but I don't buy too much into that just because we've seen it before with faults and like we've seen it we've just seen a countless amount. We've seen the warm up his warm up threes from uh, Twitter and stuff, and I I think I need to see it in a game to have to fully believe that. I think he went out and worked out a lot this offseason, but for me to believe in his jump shot, I need to see it in a real game. And I don't think he's going to be anywhere near a top three-point shooter, but I think he'll mix in. I'll say my over-under would be like three and a half threes a game maybe, which I think wow. would be a huge step for him. Yeah, that, that that would be an enormous step. I don't I don't quite have that confidence in it, but 
the more and more that we do see those videos and the more and more he, he talks about it, I, I agree a bit. I, th- I think he's going to tr- really work on it this year now um, and make it, make it more of a part of his game, uh, which is going to be strange. He's never had a three-point jump shot ever. I'm, I'm in the weird minority in where I don't really think he needs one, but I definitely can see the opposite side and how everyone thinks he does. Um, I don't know. I think, I think this is an interesting year for Ben Simmons. I think this is where he either becomes just a Hall of Fame level talent or, you know, he just kind of fades off a bit. So I'm excited to see that. Um, how do you feel about LeBron James? It's one of the things Shane and I always talk about. We always bring it up. I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with, with our takes on him, but I, I'm always curious to see how everyone else reacts about him. I am a huge LeBron James fan, and anyone that knows me knows that I will defend him till the end. And I think, I mean, this is, uh, this could be a debate for another day, but I think I def I think if I had a pick, I mean, I think it's hard to tell because of different errors and stuff. But I think I think I would put him over Jordan. I know it's probably close, but I'm a huge LeBron fan. I'd still say he's definitely a top two player in the NBA. You could make the argument for Durant, but I think. I think LeBron still has the edge over most players. Wow. All right. I got to get you on with Shane so that I can have you guys argue over the merits of LeBron James for a while. Um, I'm more of the middle of the road on him. I think he's great. I, I, I definitely love to knock on LeBron, but I, I'm excited to see how him and Anthony Davis play together in, in Los Angeles. I mean, I last week I voted them the best duo in the NBA. I think, I think he's just too good. I mean, he's getting a little older now, but I, the guy is, is just he's unbelievable in the core it, it would be stupid whether you like him or not you like the taco tuesday antics or not um it would be stupid to underrate him and not think that he's as good as he is still so uh, I, yeah I, I think that duo is going to be insane i think i just think and i don't know if you heard the quotes they had over the weekend they're saying like I thought some of the stuff they were saying was pretty interesting. Davis was like, oh, we're going to be a defensive-minded team first, which I thought was interesting with all the offensive talent they have on that that team. And, like, I don't – outside of Davis and LeBron, I don't know where the defense would come from. But then LeBron said they're going to run the offense through Anthony Davis. So I, I just thought that was some interesting – two interesting quotes from those two guys. Yeah, I'd, I'd seen, too, that Avery Bradley uh, is healed up and lost some weight. Um they're, I'm thinking he'll play some tough defense a little bit, um, but but yeah. So I, I'm curious to see how that team plays out. I look, I hate the Lakers. Don't get me wrong, I definitely do. But basketball is better when the Lakers are good. So I'm happy that they're going to be good this year, and they will definitely be a team that I'll be watching probably more than I care to admit. Um, one of the other people that we do tend to talk about quite a bit is J.J. Redick. Um, J.J. Redick had, had just left the, the Sixers. Um, I saw a great quote from him today at our media day that he told uh, Zion not to blow his, his streak of making the playoffs the last 11 years, which I thought was kind of awesome. That was their first interaction together, and that just came out now. Um, how do you feel about J.J. Redick and his, his exit from the team um, and his tenure as a Sixer? First, the exit. I thought the exit was one of the most surprising things in terms of Sixers offseason. Like, I think we all just expected he'd be back. Whether like, I think we all. Expect, I know I thought the money wouldn't be an issue. I thought he'd take a little pay cut, but obviously that wasn't the case. Uh, that was uh, that was so surprising. And how surprising was like how fast it happened. Like, it was like I think may, it might have been the first signing of the like official free agency opening was him going to. The, the Pelicans, but in terms of his time with the Sixers, I thought I thought he had some career years here with us, and I, I thought his defense hurt us at times in the playoffs. But I think he was probably one of the most reliable three-point shooters we could have asked for, outside of some other like Hall of Famers that played in his era. But I mean, every I know he wasn't the clutchest player, but every time he shot it, I, it had a good shot to go in. So yeah, I agree. Uh, I I have. Pretty much nothing but good things to say about J.J. Redick. I think he's he's a solid three-point shooter, one of the all-time greats. Um, I think I think he had a great tenure here in Philadelphia. You know, we we would definitely miss him, and I was sad to see him go. But but I get it. I, I get why he needed to move on a little bit and be worried about his family and 
make a little bit more money and, and try and do something else um, at the end of his career. I would have loved to see him stay here and help us win a ring, but hey, you know, we we'll, we'll be okay without him. And I mean, if he wants to come back and, and two years of his contract's up or we trade for him or something or work something out, I think we'd all be more than happy to have him back. Um, then how do you feel about the incoming class of Sixers rookies? And I'm going to include our boys, Zaire Smith, in this as well. I want to get some quick takes from you on you know, Smith and Tybal and all those guys coming in. What what are you expecting from them? Um, I think first, I think I'll start with our first round pick and uh, Thibel, but I think his defense is what they're going to rely on the most in certain uh, parts of the game, and he's more of the three and D type player. So I think they'll try to find him open on the the corners and hit the corner three ball. Um. I think I know he's not the he's not a rookie, but in terms of kind of like Zaire Smith, I'm I'm a big Shake Milton guy, so I I think he's gonna be one of the sleepers of last year's draft, which he didn't get to play that much, so he might be considered a rookie. So I think him and Zaire Smith could be two big pieces from last year's draft, who are basically rookies this year, and I think you'll see some struggle to start the season with. I mean that comes with any young player, I feel like outside of the huge like first overall guys. So I think the development in those two guys will be key because I think Shake Milton's going to be a huge part of the backup point guard role. And then Zaire Smith, they're going to rely on him to improve his jump shot. And that's what I'm most excited to see is like, we got a lot of defenders like Smith and Thibault. Like those, those two young guys are, are going to be key parts of the defense. And that's what I'm most excited with those two. Yeah, I agree. I'm I'm a big shake guy. Um, do you get worried at all about how he did not look good in summer league this year? I don't take too much in the summer league, honestly. So I I think I didn't take too much from it. I, I guess there's a little worry, but I think the G League, which he was in last year, is a lot more to look at than the summer league, honestly. And I think the way he scored in that is very impressive. So I think when he can actually work with real like i say real but like high key players on the team and become a full key rotate rotation player i think that's when you'll really see his development come out in, in this team yeah i i go back and forth on this i mean clearly this is just a sign that i have too much time in my hands but i think about shake milton quite often and i'm a little worried about how summer league played out but you know as we get further and further from that i agree with you summer league doesn't mean too much it's it's good during the summer when you know we we get to see a little basketball and it scratches that itch, but probably we probably shouldn't be looking too far into that at this point. Um, we moved past it, you know. We're like I said, we're, we're weeks away from the regular season starting off, and we're all getting excited about it. So yeah, Shake is going to have to be a big part of the team this year, and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do, and hopefully he will step up. So I don't have to eat more words here. Um, all right, and then I guess those are most of the things we seem to, to talk about all the time. Um, I'm sure there's a couple other things that will just naturally come up, but is there anything that you've noticed from listening to the show or interacting with Shane and I offline that you know you were just burning to get at and, and yell at us and call us liars or tell us why we're wrong or agree with or anything from the Sixers anywhere around the NBA? No, I thought, I mean, going off last week, I thought the Joy Howard stuff was pretty funny. Um, I, th- I think I think we all have very similar opinions on that. Uh, I think I love listening to the show. I think you guys do a great job. And I, I just, I had nothing literally to say. I like, question you guys with. I, I agree. I have, it's a fun time. All right, cool. Well, hey, we're, we're happy to have you on here. And we'll definitely have to get Shane on here with you as well. Like I said, I need to hear that LeBron James debate because as we all know, Shane is quite the LeBron hater. I uh, just cannot hate him more than Shane does. Um, so with that in mind, as we get near the end of our show here, I want to do one of our favorite bits. And this is a bit of a unique take on our favorite bit, Zaire's stash. So for Zaire's stash, we, we typically like to compare – Another NBA player of past or present to the seventh best player in the NBA, Zaire Smith, in looks because our boy Zaire Smith is dapper as fuck. Um, so, what we had talked about a bit before the show is we're gonna have a weird comparison. We're gonna p- compare Zaire Smith to himself because 
we had seen a pretty hilarious picture. It was not intended to be hilarious, but on Zaire's Instagram the other day of him in a what what would you call the outfit he's wearing, Andrew? I don't even know if there's a good word for. It. I mean, it's just a it's striped overalls and like he's got I, the blue he has on it matches the blue stripe on his shoes. I mean, it's definitely a planned outfit. It's just I I don't know if it's the best look for him. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a weird take. Um, my biggest problem with it isn't even isn't even the the weird overalls. It isn't even the the weird grill he has on, which I didn't even notice. Andrew pointed that out to me. I mean. It looks like he paid a bunch of money to have someone make his teeth look dirty for, for all I can see. Um, but it's probably a thousand dollar grill or whatever. It's the Puma sneakers he's rocking. I didn't realize that year was a Puma athlete. Um, I haven't looked into it much further, but I, I would be disappointed to hear if he is because no one is a Puma athlete in the NBA. I mean, the only one I can think of off the top of my head is DeMarcus Cousins. Like, can you, can you think of any other Puma athletes? The only, I don't remember which one, but it was one of the big uh, NBA rookies that came out, signed uh, – whoever came out of the M- or came into the NBA draft this past year. Uh, it might have been John Morant. I forget. But he one of them signed with Puma. And, and I, I know they're, they're trying to make a big splash in the market because I keep hearing a little more about him. But honestly, I think the shoes are the best part of his outfit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're probably the best looking part. I, I just have such a weird, weird take on Puma shoes. Who, who knows? I'll probably be – wearing them in like a month or two when I, when Zaire's crushing it out on the court. Um, but with that in mind, let, let's stick with the theme of the segment here. Do you think Zaire Smith in that outfit is better looking than Zaire Smith on a random day? I do not. I would go with Zaire Smith on a random day. Okay. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, I, I just don't, I don't know what he's doing. I guess he's, he's young trying out some, some crazy looks or whatever. Um, I obviously have a problem with the sneakers. I'm not going to be able to get over it. But, but yeah, so so with that, we've officially compared Zaire Smith to Zaire Smith. Not something I thought I would do at this point in the in the podcast. But um, I'm happy that we've been able to keep that bit going for a while. And you know what I'm happy most of all about is we got our boy Andrew on the line here. And we're, we're getting him into some Sixers talk. And, you know, this, this has been a great show. I, I've very much enjoyed your time, Andrew. And, you know, thanks for hopping on. We'll definitely have to have you back. I mean, we got to get you on with Shane. We, we'll get you back on, you know, as we get closer to the year, and we've got some more Sixers basketball to talk about. You have any closing thoughts over there? I just want to say thanks for having me on. It was absolutely a great time. I'd love to be back if there's more opportunities to. And, I mean, I think the Sixers preseason is – the preseason games are one week out tomorrow, and I am very excited for that to happen, especially – after the disappointing Philly season. So I'm ready for all the Philadelphia sports to get back in action. Absolutely. We, we all definitely need to wash the terrible taste of the Phillies out of our mouths. Uh, we did have a big win with the Eagles the other day, but um, you know, I'm, I'm just so jacked up about the Sixers this year that I'm almost forgetting about that win. So as we get ready to sign off here, Andrew, can you share with the listeners your Twitter handle so that they can follow you and start checking out some of your takes? Yeah, so my Twitter is at AJ underscore Santangelo, which is my last name, uh, S-A-N-T-A-N-G-E-L-O. All right, and then you can follow me as always at S-P Novik. Andrew, thanks for hopping on. And this has been the TJ is One of Us segment at the ANYP Podcast Network. We are happy to have you as listeners. And as always, go Sixers. Till next week. See you guys. Now I'm back to hitching me and throwing. But if Mickey Flynn should ever find me, I'll throw me call shit all behind me and square off on that son of a bitch again. He cracked open a river too, he beat me so they through and through. And so she over my unconscious frame. I want me healthy sheriff fights, well lucky son still have me life since Mickey Flynn beat me down and lame.